Hello and welcome. I'm Seth Bosted, and I'm the lecturer for the Grant Park Music Festival's 2021 season. And I'm going to talk about a concert that will be taking place on Wednesday, July 28th. And uh, this concert features the great afternoon or prelude to the afternoon of a fawn by Claude Debussy, a classic. Uh, probably all know that piece. And then moving into a piece that probably none of us knows, <laughs> which is uh, a flute concerto in E minor by Severio Mercadante from the 19th century. Wonderful showpiece for the flute, and our flute soloist for that is Anthony Trionfo. And then the concert will close out with the Symphony Number no. 2 by French composer Camille Saint Saëns. Uh, and that is not the symphony that most people perform by St. Saul. Usually it is the third symphony, the organ symphony. So this is a, a gem that is not performed very often, and it's pretty exciting that Maestro Kalmar has chosen to end the concert with this piece. First up is Prelude to the Afternoon of a Fawn. And before I say anything about this piece, the backdrop, uh, the inspiration, etc., let's just listen to the opening, because the opening of this piece absolutely changed everything. It's about a minute of the opening of this iconic piece, Prelude to the Afternoon of a Fawn by Claude Debussy. The year is 1894. There's a whole lot going on in music at this time. In Germany, we're at the end of the Romantic era. The pieces are getting larger and larger. Wagner has come along with this Gesamtkunstwerk, these huge, huge artistic creations. Uh, Mahler has come along. Bruckner has come along. They've expanded the symphony. They're doing all of these things. And the French are saying, eh, it's so pompous. It's so overblown. We're going to go a completely different direction. Think of Eric Satie. Think of Maurice Ravel writing these smaller pieces, these miniatures. And composers like Debussy were inspired by the uh, Impressionistic movement, of course, in painting, but they were also inspired by the Symbolist movement in poetry. Uh, in this case, Stefan Mallarmé wrote the poem, Prelude to the Afternoon of a Fawn, that inspired this music by Debussy. And we say that Debussy is an Impressionistic uh, composer, but I think he's just as much a Symbolist composer. That movement didn't really go very far, which is a shame. Uh, it was a fascinating movement. They were interested in abstraction. They did not want to provide a concrete narrative. They instead wanted to leave the reader with a general impression of something. So in the case of Prelude to the Afternoon of a Fawn, Mallarmé's idea here is to depict this half-goat, half-human creature in these earthly pursuits, chasing after nymphs, eating sumptuous repasts, <laughs> drinking wine, taking long naps, this kind of thing. And so what Debussy does in the music is it's, it's uh, these little episodes in this day, this languid opening, the kind of sensuality that's present in the music almost immediately was completely different than anything that had come before in classical music and very much intentionally. Debussy's harmonic language is different as well. He's using these open ninths, he's using fourths and fifths, 
Uh, some of the chords don't have a third in them at all. You don't need to know music to know that that was very, very unusual. And it gives this, the, this open-ended kind of sound. It doesn't feel like it's going anywhere. It's just there. <laughs> it's this beautiful place to, to exist musically. Let's jump about six minutes in and hear another episode from Prelude to the Afternoon of a Fawn by Claude Debussy. So a little more of this piece by Claude Debussy. So many influences in this piece. Debussy had spent some time in Russia. Uh, he was very interested in what they called Oriental sounds. Orientalism was a big uh, facet of the French composers, what they were doing here at the last little bit of the 19th century. He's also interested in American jazz. We don't hear that quite so much in this piece, but you do hear it in other Debussy works. And most of all, he's interested in this symbolist idea of abstraction. Again, the music doesn't go anywhere. Uh, it's not necessarily a journey like you wind up someplace different from where you began. You stay more or less where you are the whole time, and it's beautiful the whole time. Again, this was a total game changer in classical music, well, in music in general, and it will open up the concert. And we go from there to a very different kind of piece and a very different use of the flute. And this is uh, Saverio Mercadente. This is one of his flute concertos, this one in E minor. And uh, I talked to the soloist, Anthony Trionfo, about this piece. Hi, Anthony. Thanks so much for joining me. Thanks so much for having me. This uh, piece that you're playing on, the Mercadante, is not a very well-known piece. Is this something that you discovered through the Grant Park Music Festival? You know, it is not the most well-known piece, that's true. But within the flute circle, it's uh, kind of a cult classic, I have to say. So I'm really excited to be able to play it with Grant Park, and it's amazing that Grant Park programmed it. But it, it's a piece that I've kind of grown up at least listening to a lot, never playing it, however. What is it about it that makes it a cult classic? Just the way he writes for flute, or uh, what is it? Yeah, so for the one thing, yes, it's extremely, the writing for flute is just so florid, um, very similar to the bel canto style, very operatic, Italian, of course, um, just gorgeous and very regal. Um, for me, it's very similar to some virtuosic violin concertos, uh, like Vietam, although that's French, uh, because it's very... There's so much that's going on in the flute, and it's really a star. So that's what I love about it so much. Yeah. What's the musical language of the piece? Is it more on the Baroque side, or, or going get into so classical? It's, it's it's heavily romantic, heavily heavily um, operatic, uh, written in eighteen nineteen, I believe. Um, yeah, and the composer was only nineteen himself. Um, yeah, actually, no, sorry, written in eighteen fourteen. Right. Yeah, he was nineteen. So very very. Um, total 19th century style as well. I am so excited to play with Grant Park. Um, it's a festival that I've known about for a long time. Uh, the orchestra is obviously phenomenal. Uh, Carlos Calmar is fantastic. I had the chance to work with him when he conducted, uh, he was a guest conductor at Colburn School where I went to school and we worked with him then. So it's great to be working with him again and I'm excited for that. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't wait for it. I'm really excited to be a part of this. I love the idea that uh, this flute concerto is a cult classic for flutists. <laughs> uh, it is certainly a uh, virtuosic piece. At the time that it was written in the middle of the 19th century, it must have been considered almost unplayable. Uh, the flute had not quite yet reached 
the, the limits of its technical capability where it is today. The flute was still kind of in development. It was a work in progress, as it were, at that time. And so uh, Saverio Mercadente is an Italian composer, very much in the Romantic tradition. He wrote a lot of opera, as did any Italian composer in the 19th century. He sort of had to. Uh, but he spent a lot of time in Spain as well, where he worked as a conductor, and he worked in the conservatory, and he met a couple of very, very good flutists. And this is why he wrote so many flute concertos. So, so the piece, as compared to the Debussy, is a more traditional use of the flute, more what we think the kind of glittering, sparkling, cascading arpeggios, big runs, trills, the, that kind of uh, virtuosic activity in the flute is very much present. I'm going to play a little bit of the first movement and then a little bit of the last movement. So the first movement opens up with a big introduction. It's kind of unusual. This is for flute and string orchestra. And we hear the strings for almost two minutes before the flute comes in. I'm going to skip the intro and just start right away where the soloist, in our case, Anthony Trionfo, enters. The second movement is a very short movement and it's quite wonderful. Uh, again, opens up with a, an introduction in the strings. I think that comes from Mercadante's operatic background. There is this kind of dramatic sense that the music is beginning um, in the first second movements. The third movement is the most famous and it's called Russian Rondo. It's a quote unquote Russian theme, a theme that Mercadante uh, thought of as being Russian. And this piece just starts up right away, this movement. Um, so I want to play a little bit of the opening so you hear the theme. And then when I go all the way to the end, the last minute or so, the theme goes into minor. Mercadante has a lot of fun with it to wrap up the piece. <laughs> That's a little bit of the Mercadante Flute Concerto in E minor. That will be the second piece on the program. It's in three movements. It's a beautiful, wonderful showpiece for the flute. It is romantic in its scope, in its emotionality. Uh, but for me, at least, my ears, it's, it's also very Baroque in the sense that it has these uh, very clear textures. Uh, definitely not going for the emotional heaviness of some of the late romantics in the German tradition. And then again, coming from the Italian operatic tradition, I think that we do hear a sense of drama in uh, all three of the movements. And again, that piece will feature the soloist Anthony Trionfo. The concert will conclude with Symphony No. 2 in A minor by Camille Saint-Saëns. This is a fascinating work. I didn't know this piece, uh, Symphony 1 and 2. 
of St. Saint Saint before uh, I started uh, researching this lecture, and it, it, I really enjoyed delving into this work. It is a fascinating piece in many respects. St. Saint actually wrote five symphonies, but two are unnumbered. Uh, one in E-flat is a real gem, but it's hardly ever played. So this is a real treat to hear symphony number two on this concert. St. Saint himself was uh, one of the great prodigies uh, in music of all time. In fact, there are stories that uh, by the time he was 10 years old, he could already play all 32 Beethoven piano sonatas by memory which uh, if that's true then this is a kid who didn't spend a lot of time on the playground i think this was an indoor kid uh i mean it's an amazing feat if, if it's true at any rate there was certainly a time in his life when he could play all 32 of the sonatas by memory he was one of the world's great organists uh conductors a phenomenal musician across the board his music became very fashionable within his own lifetime and then not so much and today we're rediscovering a lot of the music because he was a very prolific composer. Interestingly, uh, Saint-Saëns wrote most of his masterpieces, including this symphony, during a very difficult time in his life. He and his wife unfortunately lost two children when they were very, very young. Uh, this tragic episode must have had a huge impact, needless to say, and yet you don't hear it in the music at all. Uh, let's start in the first movement here. I want to play a couple of uh, what I call oral signposts, a couple of things you can listen for when you hear the full piece. Uh, so the piece opens up with this motive in A minor, falling thirds and then rising seconds. Very simple motive. Much like Debussy, saint saint was not so interested in sonata form. He was not interested in the classical forms. He didn't go as far as Debussy. He didn't use a narrative to guide him. Um, but nonetheless, the way that he develops his uh, material is very interesting. Let's have a listen. A little bit of the opening of the A minor symphony, symphony number two by Camille Saint-Saëns. Uh, wonderful what he does with that theme, these stacked thirds that go down and then rising by second. Very, very simple based on the, the key of the piece in A minor. The second movement is a beautiful little gem in E major, which is the five chord of A minor, so a pretty, pretty normal place to go in many respects. It's a very short movement, um, so I'm going to let you enjoy that. And the third movement also is fairly short. It is a scherzo. We're back in the stormy A minor. Uh, things are a bit more active. I want to jump all the way to the last movement and play several minutes of it because, for me at least, this is one of the places where saint saint kind of uh, loses his polish, so to speak, and, and lets us see a little bit of his inner life, uh, perhaps a little bit of turmoil even. So I'm going to play the opening. Listen to the theme. It's this very fast, wonderful theme. And then he starts to vary it throughout the movement. I'm going to jump from there about five and a half minutes in. There's this beautiful moment where uh, he, he takes that theme. And as I said, it becomes more emotional now. Uh, St. Saint doesn't normally show this, this side of him. So this is a really interesting glimpse.
That's music by Camille Saint-Saëns, the fourth movement of the Second Symphony in A minor, and that piece will conclude the concert. Uh, Saint-Saëns was a phenomenally interesting human being. In addition to music, he was interested in astronomy, uh, travel, math. He was a, a bit of a polymath in, in many respects, had a lot of interests. When his music fell out of fashion, he kind of went and became a hermit. <laughs> he just didn't really... Uh, want to be around people that much. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know if he, he might have been surprised to know that his music is making something of a comeback today. Uh, so that will be the end of the concert. It is a phenomenal concert. Again, our soloist is Anthony Trionfo, and the concert features Maestro Carlos Calmar and the Grant Park Music Festival Orchestra. I'm Seth Bostead. Thanks so much for listening, and hope to see you at a future talk.